So thanks both of you for coming in today. You've both sure. done this before, but just for the benefit of uh, the videotaping, if you would truly introduce yourself, uh, state the office that you're running for, your party affiliation, and then just give us a brief intro as to a little bit of bio, very little, a little bit about why you're running, and then we'll go from there. Um, as you both recall from previous visits, um, we'd like to have you uh, respond to each other. If your opponent says something you disagree with or feel you'd like to rebut or, or respond to, please do so. Please keep it civil. We'll cut you off if, if we've heard enough, not to be rude, but because we have a lot of ground to cover. And um, we'll uh, start with you, Rob. Okay. Thank you. I'm Rob Cornelis, and I'm the Republican nominee running in the 1st Congressional District in this special election. Uh, I'm a native Oregonian. Born and raised right here in the Portland area, in the metro area. Uh, I have a wife, Alice Allison, who I've been married to for 25 plus years with three children. Uh, two in college, one in high school. I started a business as well here in the area about 16 and a half years ago. And it's a company called Game Face. And we have employed 60 people in that time. And we work uh, primarily, but not exclusively, in the professional sports world, uh, advising and consulting with professional sports franchises and their business operations. But our business and services have also been utilized throughout, uh, throughout the manufacturing sector, uh, professional services, uh, financial services, retail, etc. But most of our business, that which we're known for, is really within the sports community. Where did you grow up? Uh, well, I was born in Portland, grew up in Tigard primarily. Tigard High. Uh, no, when, when I was entering high school, we moved to Newburgh, and so I went to Newburgh High School. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm one of seven children. What'd your uh, folks do? My father was an attorney, and my mom was uh, was a stay-at-home mom. In Portland? Was he a lawyer? Yeah, yeah that's right. And he's uh, long since retired. Are all your siblings supporting your candidacy? <laughs> I, I believe they are. Uh, only a few of them live here. I'm the only one who was able to graduate from college, uh, but... So our, our, our business success is something that uh, we're proud of, uh, my wife and I. And, uh, and so I've got supportive family. I have a brother who owns a landscaping business in town. Uh, he's been in business for nearly 30 years, I believe. Uh, he's been very successful in landscaping. So Rob, why, uh, why are you running? Well, I'm running because, uh, same reason as last time, I have felt for far too long the first congressional district, which I believe is is blessed with tremendous assets, has been largely underrepresented. And uh, as, a, as a bystander for many years, someone who's just been trying to grow a business and raise a family, uh, I had faith in, and confidence in the system that eventually we'd have better representation, but for far too long that didn't happen. And so in 2009, I decided to do something that was frankly uncomfortable and unpredictable, and that is run for Congress. Uh, because I was tired of waiting for someone else to step up. Had you ever thought about running for any other office? No, I hadn't. And never statewide office? Well, I had, I had, uh, no, the nature of my business, frankly, wouldn't have permitted me to run for office because I traveled so much, yeah. so I could run for school board or city council, but I wouldn't be at most of the meetings. Right. Obviously, when you run for Congress, if you're successful, it's a whole different lifestyle and career. Um, but I, uh, I was always engaged in the process as far as paying attention, um, you know, doing my best to follow what was going on both locally and nationally. And, uh, and so I finally decided this was the right time and our, our, our state and this, this region specifically needs someone with my background and, and my skill set. Okay. Suzanne? I first came to Oregon in the 70s. Introduce yourself. I'm sorry. Suzanne Bonamici. I'm the Democratic candidate for the 1st Congressional District. Thank you for the opportunity for us to uh, tell you who we are and what we stand for. I first came to Oregon in the 70s, fell in love with the state, worked my way through Lane Community College and University of Oregon and the U of O Law School working at Legal Aid, helping low-income families. Why did you start community college instead of going right to the U of O? Because that's what I could afford. I worked my way through. I had already left home, and my parents didn't have the money to pay for me to go to college, so I got a combination of work, study, and student loans and grants. So I was working at Legal Aid, helping low-income families. 
then went right from uh, community college to the U of O, transferred almost all my credits, got a journalism degree, and then went directly to law school, continuing to work at legal aid and helping low-income families. But I want to back up just a minute and say that my very first job wasn't at legal aid. It was in my mom's small business. She had a retail store for years, and I helped her do everything from buying product to serving customers to bookkeeping. What kind of store? It's a little retail store that was a craft store and art store and natural food okay. store in Michigan. Where? Michigan, Northville, Michigan. In a mall and no, town? No, no, on Main Street. It's an independent small business, right? And I learned a lot from her. Uh, and then when I was working at Legal Aid, I got interested in consumer protection. And so right after law school, my first job out of law school was back in Washington, D.C. at the Federal Trade Commission. I was doing consumer protection work in the Credit Practices Division, enforcing federal credit laws like truth and lending, working on a mortgage fraud case back before the financial crisis. Uh, as a young attorney convinced the commission during the Reagan administration to bring a case against some mortgage brokers who were defrauding people out of their homes. I met my husband, Michael. What, what happened with that case? Uh, the Federal Trade Commission brought the case. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission doesn't have criminal jurisdiction. The Department of Justice picked it up because they saw that the behavior was so uh, egregious that it violated criminal laws. So they criminally prosecuted the mortgage brokers, and they ended up serving time. So as an FTC lawyer, what, what were you doing day to day? Were you, were you on the intake end of complaints, or how were you Not usually. No, I, uh, a lot of the time I was working on that case. Uh, I was also working on truth and lending issues. Uh, I wrote part of the statement of basis and purpose and regulatory analysis for a trade regulation rule, just whatever fit within the credit practices division work. Uh, that included equal credit opportunity, fair credit reporting, truth and lending. Sometimes we got complaints from consumers, but as a federal agency, we couldn't represent individuals, so we would try to refer them. Uh, to some place where they could get assistance, but if we saw a pattern, then we would uh, bring it to the head of the division to see if we could take action. There has to be a sort of public interest before the Federal Trade Commission will bring so a case. Put a little bit on fast forward to your right. term of the legislature. Right. So I moved from Washington, D.C. to Washington County, practiced law for a couple of years, representing small businesses, then took a career break to raise my kids, got very involved in the community. Remind us what firm you worked for when you were. Uh, it was then called Stole and Stole. Uh, now as a longer, different name. Stolburn, I think it's gone through different different names. Uh, but I represented mostly small businesses when I was there, and then took a career break, did a lot of volunteer work in the community for schools and nonprofit organizations, arts organizations, classroom law project, uh, and became an advocate for public education. I saw cuts being made and got very interested in public policy, primarily because of education, and first served in the legislature in 2007, in the House, and then after one term was appointed and then elected to the Senate and served two terms in the Senate, became a leader on consumer protection issues, improving education, and working with our state economic development department to get capital to entrepreneurs and small businesses. So you were at Stoll and Stoll how long? Um, about three years. And you left? <coughs> Why? To raise children. Okay. Were you a partner at that time? No, I was not. On a partnership track? I was on a partnership track. I'm right. I was an associate. Do they not allow you to raise children and work as a lawyer? <laughs> it, was a personal, it was a personal choice. Uh, I, I had one of those days where I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning and flew to Seattle and took a deposition. And by the time I got back, the baby was asleep. And I just said, life is too short. And I had, was fortunate enough to be able to take a break and, and, and be an at-home mom. But an at-home mom who wasn't at home very much because I did so much volunteer work in the community. So it was a personal choice. It had nothing to do with it. And how old are your kids now? 21 and 23. So running for Congress because? Yes. I'm running for Congress because this district is ready for someone with proven leadership, uh, someone who has experience working across the aisle, someone who knows the district and knows what it takes to create jobs in the short term and the long term, and someone with a background like consumer protection who understands what we need to do to rebuild consumer confidence and make sure we don't have another financial crisis. Someone so that has actually answered the question about why you're running for Congress. You've answered the question why the district might need someone with your skills. Right. That's why I'm but, running for but Congress. But I want to know personally, what is it that's motivating you to run for Congress, which would involve you moving to D.C.? Absolutely. Your husband lives... Well, he lives here, but that's true with anyone running for Congress, that, that right. it's a lifestyle change. 
because I believe it's time for proven leadership in Congress. And I have the skills and the background and the plan uh, and the support of the district. Uh, With all due respect, Suzanne, you've answered why Congress might need you. You really haven't answered personally why you want to run for Congress, why you decided that now is the time for you to seek this position. Right. Now is the time because I am at a point in time where, uh, number one, I've established a record. Number two, personally, it's time. My kids are grown. But more importantly, this district is ready for new leadership. Has this been and a I can... for some time? And has no, this been on no, the horizon? It, no, no, it has not. I've been thinking about it for uh, at least a couple of years, but certainly not a goal of mine. I never dreamed that I would go into politics. Um, Explain something to me. Sure. Will the winner have to run for re-election in November? Yes. And actually, will the winner have to run in the primary in May? If there's a primary challenge, yes, that's correct. And under the new district lines, it'll be a different... The, the current so the primary that you run for will have a different boundaries, the district will have different boundaries than the race here? Than the, that is correct. Okay. So will both of you run against If Suzanne wins, will you run in the primary and then seek to defeat her in the in November? And the same goes for you. I'm planning on winning at, at the end of but the month. But if, so. if, if the sky should fall and it doesn't happen? I'll answer that on February 1st. Okay. I'll ask you on February 1st. How about you? I haven't looked beyond February 1st. I'm really committed just to the next 30 days. So, so let's move to an issue that uh, affects parts of most of your district, actually, most of CD1, uh, the timber payments issue. So that's been a problem since the mid-1990s. Rob, if you were elected, what, what would you like to do about it? Well, first of all, I've been encouraged just in the last few weeks, maybe even the last few days, to see that we have a bipartisan coalition from our delegation currently with Congressman Walden, DeFazio, and Schrader coming together, and also with a governor who seems to be very supportive of, of their federal efforts, who want to bring a solution to the problem for 2012, because we all know these payments are going to end. Uh, and, and we're looking at counties, especially the rural counties of Oregon, that are facing bankruptcy if they don't get these federal payments. But I think we need to step back, and I would like to be a part of that discussion. In fact, I'd like to sit at the table with those people and work as a delegation to provide real solutions long term for these counties. But I think it's also, it needs to be said that in the conversations I've had with people in the timber industry, and frankly, I've had conversations with people in the timber industry all over the state because their problems affect my district, um, they really, almost to a person, never come to me and say, you got to make sure we extend the timber payments. What they almost say universally is, you have to make sure we can get back into the forest and manage our forests and take care of this natural resource we have. In other words, we want jobs more than payments. And I think we could all agree that over the last 20 to 30 years, slowly but surely, that industry, which as I grew up in Oregon, I saw was really the catalyst for economic development in this state, it's become a depressed industry. And I can't say it's a fault of theirs. It's a fault of, of I think, special interest coming in and suggesting that the people who manage our forests are, can't do it as well as a bureaucrat can in Washington, D.C. So, so essentially more cutting. That, that you, you, you're responsibly cutting. Yeah, we, I mean, I've said it many times before. I think anyone who lives in Oregon, if they're not already, becomes an environmentalist. That's one reason we live here. So. This, this notion that there are some people who just want to destroy the forest and not make it sustainable for the future are people who don't understand our state. They don't understand the people who have, through generations, have managed our forests. And you know, I just had a conversation today with someone in, in Astoria who comes from the timber industry. And he's running a generational, intergenerational company there. He wants to make sure that it's there for the next generation, whether it be his family, his workers' families, etc. So. Nobody in the timber industry wants to obliterate that industry. They want to make sure it's sustainable. So it's a job creator. 
Uh, it's also a way of managing forests so that they're preserved, not to mention the habitat within the forest. You know, we can't, we can't afford to see infestation and things like that or forest fires that basically see all that revenue go up in smoke, all that potential, not to mention putting a, you know, damaging the habitat and, and the people who would use the forest for recreation and other reasons. So it's a critical organ issue. It's one of the few things that we're seeing right now in our delegation where everybody's coming together and saying, we got to work on this. And we need to be a champion to the people back in Washington that are making decisions in this regard. So the governor's task force in 2009 recommended that the state consider uh, as one of the potential solutions a real estate transfer tax. Have you any position on a real estate transfer tax? No, no, but I, I'm interested in really what Governor, uh, what Governor Kitsocker is doing right now, and some of it admittedly is undefined. But the fact, that, the fact that he has called attention to this matter in his first year in office, and he's been pretty bold about it, and he has said, we need to bring all ideas to the table, and we need to bring what have been historically competing sides, both the environmental movement as well as the business uh, interests. We need to bring them together. To me, this is a very positive thing. It's one of the few things in Oregon right now that we can all say, you know, we're working together on this. And I just want to be a part of that. Suzanne? We absolutely need to continue the timber payments for now. Uh, not only have I heard about counties uh, potentially filing bankruptcy, I sat and listened to testimony about it, which is heart-wrenching and, and very disconcerting. Uh, yes, we need to find a way to revitalize the industry, uh, and that includes smarter forest policy, and I know that many members of the delegation are working on that. That being said, we also need an approach that helps our small rural communities rebuild uh, and create jobs, and that's one of the reasons why I'll be working, continuing the work that I did in the legislature, helping entrepreneurs and small businesses get access to capital. That's something I did at the state level. It's something that I will do in Congress, because that's going to help the small rural communities as well. Uh, we need to revitalize uh, the industries, and uh, I, as somebody who graduated from community college, I understand the importance of relevant job training. We need to have job training programs that are connecting our community colleges uh, with the businesses in the area. Can you talk as yeah, specifically as you can about improving access to capital? What are you talking about? Yes. Well, at the state level, uh, what I did was I worked with Business Oregon. Uh, they have an entrepreneurial development loan fund and a business development loan fund. I went to them and said, what can we do to help small businesses get access to capital that they need? They're having trouble with the financial markets. Uh, they, uh, we talked about some of the uh, requirements were overly burdensome. We streamlined the requirements. We recapitalized those loan funds. The day after the governor signed the bill, they were lending to a small business. Uh, we extended that program in 2011. That was a 2000. Bill. At the congressional level, I'll be doing two things to start. First, I've been working with a, the Credit Union Association, which has endorsed my candidacy. They have a member business lending cap, uh, an artificial cap uh, that uh, restricts how much they can do in business lending to their members. If we increase that cap, it's a no-cost-to-government way of helping businesses across the state and across the country. What is the cap? I, I don't know exactly. You mean what percentage is it? Yeah. I'm not sure what it is right now, but uh, I, I don't want to misquote. But we can increase that and, and still have sound underwriting. I'll also be working with a, a, a small business administration, uh, doing exactly what I did at the state level, going in and saying, what do we need? to make sure that we're, we have all the resources, not just financial, but in terms of services to help small businesses either get access to capital or get the support they need to get going. Roger, you say something? Yeah, on the state side, um, you mentioned that you helped to create capital and provide capital to small businesses. You know, I, I've looked into that, probably not as in-depth as you could, but uh, the largest hiring that took place among those companies that took advantage of that was 43 employees. They received a $700,000 loan. What company was that? Uh, in Coos Bay. Can't recall the name offhand, but a company based in Coos Bay. 43 employees, $700,000. Well, you do some math, that's $16,000 a person or thereabouts. I don't know how that's a real job. I mean, that's below minimum wage. And, and, and I would add, that company... Uh, they were actually financed to the tune of $73 million. Of that $73 million, 700000 came from this program. I don't think they hired 43 people. 
because of a $700,000 loan from the state. Now, those are business Oregon numbers. I'm not, I'm not disputing the numbers. I just don't see how they quite, uh, how they add up, okay. and I don't see how that could be considered much of a success story. Okay. Um, quick question, and then I want to ask you about Medicare. Who in <coughs> Congress right now represents, in your mind, uh, the sort of the example of the kind of congressperson you would like to model yourself after? They don't have to be from the Oregon delegation, although they could be. Well, I really admire Kristen, Kristen Gillibrand, who started in Congress. She's now in the Senate. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think she's just a strong leader, uh, represents her district well. She is her voting, if we were to look at her voting record? Oh, I wasn't necessarily you, talking about voting record. Would you largely agree with her votes? Uh, probably. Okay. I haven't examined it uh, carefully, but uh, I, I just see her as a, a great role model. She started in a uh, upstate New York mm -hmm. district and uh, got elected, and I, I think is just doing a great job. Okay. Uh, and I actually admire many members of our delegation, too, and look forward to working with them. Okay. Uh, two names come to mind immediately. Uh, the first is uh, Greg Walton. I think he's been a stalwart for our state. Uh, Greg and I differ on some things, but that's okay because uh, he's, he's a little lonely right now in our delegation. It's six versus one as far as Democrats versus Republicans in Oregon. But I think uh, Greg fights hard for his state. I don't know anyone who works harder. Uh, for his district. Sorry, I got a question your math. Six versus one? Well, now it's five versus one, isn't it? Because we're, we're, I'm speaking of senators and congressmen. Uh, yeah, I apologize. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, Greg has made, I think, like 425 round trips in his time, and no one has a bigger geographical district than he does, and he serves it entirely. But another one that always comes to mind, especially recently, is Ron White. And I think Ron White needs uh, deserves a lot of credit for the work he's doing right now in Washington, D.C. Uh, I applaud his recent efforts on a number of fronts. So perfect segue for us to ask about Medicare. Um, uh, it's hard to turn on the TV and not see your um, Medicare TV commercial where the average age of the individual that's speaking, I think, is around 73. I'm sure that's just a complete coincidence. Um, that was actually a primary commercial, but... It's yeah, still playing. I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, um, it's been around for a while because the, it's... The underlying well. message is that your position on Medicare differs from your opponent. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit. Sure. Uh, well, Rob said that he'd rather uh, cut the uh, Medicare and Social Security than the defense budget. I disagree with that. Uh, Rob is said, I believe he said you support the Wyden Ryan plan. I don't. I mean, Senator Wyden's endorsed my candidacy. Uh, but on this uh, particular issue, I disagree. I think that there are other things that we can do to protect Medicare uh, before privatizing it, before turning more of it over to the private insurance market. Uh, and the National Coalition to Protect Social Security and Medicare agrees with that. Uh, many people who have analyzed the Wyden Ryan plan agree with that, that the more people who go into the private industry in this sort of voucher type plan, uh, the, it, it does not drive down costs, on the contrary. So what would you do to drive down costs? First and foremost, I would negotiate for prescription drug costs, which is prohibited now under the law. My opponent doesn't agree with that approach. Uh, that is, uh, to me, a critical part of driving down the cost. We do that at the state level with the Oregon Prescription Drug Purchasing Pool. When you have those economies of scale and that bulk purchasing, you drive down costs. That is step number one. Step number two is I would crack down more on the abuse and the fraud. There's too much abuse and fraud. We need a, a better investigation and prosecution of that to stop the waste. Then let's look at where we are, because uh, Medicare doesn't just affect the people who are in my commercial who are the people who are getting Medicare. It also impacts the families. I was uh, talking to a family uh, just last weekend whose mother, this man's mother passed away recently, and he said, it was incredibly challenging because she had uh, so many needs that were met by Medicare. So I don't know if the average family could have handled that. So it's the people in the sandwich generation who are raising their children and helping to care for their parents as well. It's a promise that we've made. And frankly, I think we ought to be expanding Medicare, not, not cutting it back, because the more people you have in the pool, the more you drive down costs. If you have some people going out in the private industry uh, whose incentive is not to drive down costs, you leave uh, 
perhaps those with the highest needs in, in the Medicare system, that just makes it more expensive. Rob? Well, this is, uh, this is one of those issues which certain people like to use as a wedge issue with voters. Uh, I've never said that I would want to eliminate or hurt in any way Medicare or Social Security. And in fact, Suzanne and I have sat next to each other on multiple occasions where she's heard me say that I want to strengthen both of them. And I don't want to privatize either one of them either. My own, in my own party, Congressman Ryan in 2011 proposed privatizing Medicare, and I came out adamantly opposed to that. Um, I do believe that Senator Wyden and Congressman Ryan need to get some credit for having very two strong polar ideas and in the last couple of weeks bringing them together and saying, you know what, alone, neither one of us is going to accomplish what we ultimately wanted. The only way we're going to get something done is if we come together and we find compromise. That's what Congress is for. It's a body of compromise. And so, and I would add, it's, it's not a proposal, it's not even a bill, it's just a concept that they have presented. And I, I applaud their leadership. The fact that they are able to put aside, even politically, their own reputations. I mean, if, if Senator Bonamici is, is now speaking ill of Senator Wyden, that shows to me he's got the ability and the leadership to say, you know what, come what may, this is what's best for the Medicare and our seniors. So... She said at the outset that you have stated that you'd prefer to cut the Medicare budget than the defense budget. Yeah, that's why that's, that's never, never said. said that. She's extrapolating. Yeah, she's, she's extrapolating from an article that's about two and a half years old from the Daily Astorian. It was the and it was, that was never a quote of mine. And she knows it, and the people who support her know that. Um, what is it about the Wyden plan that intrigues you? Well, what really intrigues me is that um, when Suzanne talks about she doesn't want to privatize Medicare, in actuality, some of it already is. It's called the Medicare Advantage. And we have 254,000 Oregonian seniors who have chosen that as their Medicare delivery. So I don't want to take that away from them. That's their choice. She would, she would take that away from them by moving to a strictly public-only option. And I think that's wrong. So what the Wyden... Ryan plan does is it says, let's maintain a private plan, Medicare Advantage primarily, but let's also make sure that the public option is strong, viable, so that people can choose that as well. So I think seniors want choices. I think they want options. And I would add, if we don't do something about it, the Affordable Care Act will take $500 billion over the course of 10 years away from Medicare Advantage. That directly hurts Oregon seniors, and it's, it's suggested, not by me, by the, by, by the Medicare actuaries, that $500 billion taken away from Medicare over 10 years will mean that this year alone, seniors' premiums will go up almost $500, those who are choosing Medicare Advantage, and by 2017, just five years from now, it's going to be close to $900 additional expense out of pocket for those seniors. So if you don't preserve Medicare Advantage as one option, you're taking money out of seniors' pockets when they can least afford it. And are you of the belief that and you'll get a chance to respond that Suzanne is advocating that we get rid of Medicare? Advantage? Well, if she says that she doesn't want any privatization, then she's saying she doesn't want Medicare Advantage. Suzanne? Well, what I'm saying is that, and I think where Rob is getting this, is because I've said that I would, would have supported the Affordable Care Act. And if everything that's in Medicare Advantage is provided through the Affordable Care Act, or if the main benefits of Medicare Advantage are provided through the Affordable Care Act or through uh, uh, Medicare plans, then what we do by moving away from Medicare Advantage is provide the same level of services without the private industry and therefore drive down costs. It's not in the interest of the private industry to drive down costs. And I also wanted to respond, too, because I'm not Just criticizing... Just why isn't it in the interest of the private industry to drive down costs? I mean, in theory, that's how a market economy works. That's called competition. Well, because they don't have the same interests uh, in mind. They have they the, the private insurance industry is there to make a profit. And but if the insurance industry can make a profit by putting together a more attractive plan for me by reducing their costs, I mean, is that how markets are supposed to work? Well, that that's that's how a market is supposed to work. But in terms of, of Medicare, that's a promise that we've made to our seniors. 
partners. And, and I, I don't see, and, and the experts who have looked at this, like the National Council to Protect Social Security and Medicare, say that when you start putting more people into private plans, you end up increasing costs and making the service level to seniors uh, high. More, uh, more challenge. I, I wanted to go back, though, to something that Rob suggested that I that I don't uh, admire Senator Wyden for working across the aisle. I absolutely do, uh, and that's the way that I've worked in the Oregon Legislature. All the uh, main pieces of legislation that I have have sponsored in past, I brought people together. I had bipartisan support. Uh, everything from payday lending to the foreclosure rescue scams to for helping foreclosure families in foreclosure, to redistricting, to the consumer protection bills, to the ed education mandate relief, all of those were bipartisan bills. So, you know, Rob's talking about working in a bipartisan fashion. I've actually done it. I want to walk you back to when you were an advocate. You, didn't you do a lot of work in Beaverton for the schools? Yes. So tell us about that. Well, everything from rebuilding the playground, which involved getting the community and the school involved and fundraising and finding a vendor and working with the district and having a construction party and uh, rebuilding the playground to uh, working on our literacy programs to serving two terms on the Beaverton Education Foundation Board, serving on district committees. Uh, so I did classroom help. So, so you've been a strong advocate for kids? Absolutely. Public education. So one of the one of the most contentious issues in, in education currently is the issue of uh, of the layoff procedure, first in, first out. Oh, sorry, last in, first out. Unions really have around the country and in Oregon worked hard to protect the idea that teachers should be laid off in terms of seniority, right? The, the last teacher hired is the first teacher laid off. Well, that happens for for layoffs. I believe that's what they put in their collective bargaining agreements. Right. right. That's that's what they want. Is that good for kids? Not necessarily. No. So, so how would you vote on a bill that suggested that, as they've done in Illinois, they go to a merit-based layoff system? Well, then it becomes difficult because how do you measure merit? Do you do it on standardized test scores? Do you have parents critique the teachers? Do you have peer evaluations? So it depends on the details. Uh, so are you of the belief that you Possible to measure merit when it comes to teachers? Not necessarily impossible. No. Well, is it, is no. it possible? It is possible. So then, but you have to have the, the right kind of evaluation, not using standardized test scores, and make sure that you have. So if you can have the right kind of evaluation, do you support the notion of laying teachers off based on merit? I might if it's if the details are negotiated. Yes. Can you give us an example of a bill or an issue on which you oppose the OEA, a, a significant bill or issue on which you oppose the OEA? There were, there were some of the education package that I voted for that they didn't support. Such as? Uh, the, I, don't, I believe they didn't support the 909 uh, Education Board. The Education Board. Investment Board. The Investment they Board. Did not. I believe they did. I know that there was some opposition. They might have dropped it at the last minute. There was another one, too, that had to do with the Oregon employee uh, insurance pool. Uh, I was representing a district that uh, that was largely the Beaverton School District, and the Beaverton School District did not want to be part of the Oregon Employee uh, Benefit Board. And not only did, uh, did I... Uh, passed legislation that the OEA did in 2009 to make sure Beaverton stayed out, I, I talked to them about it. And I said, look, I, I know you don't agree with this, but I represent a, a legislative district that contains the Beaverton School District. They're getting a better deal on their own and don't want to be part of the board. And so uh, I, I clarified that so Beaverton could stay out if they could prove that they could get comparable benefits for their employees. But you just talked about the issue of Medicare where <coughs> Some people say Medicare Advantage strips out the healthy, the healthiest people in Medicare, and they're therefore leaving a pool of high risk, high cost people. Were you voting to do exactly that when you try to keep Beaverton out of the education? Better? No, I just don't see it the same. No, it, no, because it was a new pool. It was it was a different yeah, situation. But they want to stay out because they could get education, that they could get insurance more cheaply elsewhere, which would imply that they are younger and healthier than the average member of the education budget, right? So it was more complex than that. It didn't have to do necessarily with younger, healthier.
wealthier people. It was just that their they had a relationship with their company, and that's what they advocated for. Um, can we talk about education? Sure. For just a moment. I mean, this is a huge topic. First of all, um, speaking of Beaverton, uh, I was very grateful when the chairwoman of the Beaverton School Board and the vice chairwoman of the Beaverton School Board endorsed me just last month um, because they see me as someone who is not going to be comfortable or satisfied with the status quo, that we have to shake up the way we educate our kids. But it means that we first and foremost have to recognize that teachers play a, the absolute most critical role next to parents in accomplishing this. I'm a huge supporter of teachers. I have many teachers who support my candidacy. I think teachers, for the most part, have to, they have, we have to remove the shackles from teachers. They feel constrained in so many ways, whether it be the way that they train, or excuse me, the way that they are trained, the way that they are, their performance is measured, the way that they are um, adjudicated, uh, and also the way they're paid, and the tools that they're given in the classroom. Uh, if we are truly serious about being competitive, not only throughout the country, but if we really want to be competitive with the Indias and the Chinas and the Japans of the world, and I know a little bit about education having actually worked in Japanese schools in my 20s. Uh, I used to work for the Japanese Ministry of Education for just one school year, my, my wife and I did, and we've been in the classrooms, we've seen firsthand how they, how they operate, how they prepare kids versus what we're doing today. Now, my wife and I have chosen to put our three boys through the public school system. They're, they're, they're products of the Tiger 12th and School District. We, too, have been very involved. And I applaud Suzanne for the work she's done at Beaverton. We need more parental involvement. But we have to have someone representing this district who understands that local control, local decision making, is going to be much more advantageous and profitable, for ultimately for our children, than Washington, D.C., deciding 2,800 miles away how the, the best way to educate our kids. And if I could add one more thing on that, um, well, go ahead, Mark. You well, it's, no, it's just so uh, I'm trying to understand the difference between you two in terms of what what's the appropriate federal role in education. Well, you're very impassioned about education, but you're saying there's not really, there shouldn't be much of a federal role. Is that what I'm hearing? We, we should have the federal government, starting with the congressional representation, should shift more of the control and the resources to the local districts and classrooms and the administrators. Uh, Rather than spending so much money in Washington, D.C., trying to decide how Twalet and Tigard or Beaverton ought to be educating their kids, I also believe that teachers, excuse me, that parents need to be given more choice. And Senator Bonamici voted against open enrollment this past legislative session, even though the governor ultimately signed it. So she was definitely in the minority in giving parental choice, allowing parents more more access and more freedom in deciding the best way of educating so their kids. we're going to let Suzanne answer that. Why do you think she voted against open choice? Well, I think it's because the union didn't want it. And she's very clearly associated with the union. And I want to make this point. The union leadership, not members of the union. The members of the union, I believe, are clamoring, hoping that... They didn't like it. I voted against it because it's going to create problems for districts. And they're seeing that now as they're trying to implement it. Uh, districts have had their own policies about when students can transfer from district to district. And I think what happens when you have that sort of, of uh, uh, open policy is that you end up with uh, kids, all kids want to transfer to districts where there are better resources. Uh, what we need to do instead is make sure that we're building uh, the, the resources and having the resources and, and meeting the needs of all the students across, across the area. Uh, and, and that's problematic if we don't do that. So it had nothing to do with union opposition. That's not why I voted against the bill. It's because districts need to uh, have their own policies that work for them and that so, build each district. So other than that, can you identify some differences in opinions that you have about the federal role in education from Rob? Sure. Well, first of all, I believe that Rob said he would have voted against the stimulus bill uh, that, that passed that actually helped keep teachers in the classroom uh, last time around. Uh, I wouldn't have done that. I would have supported that because I see how devastating it is when, when teachers need to get lay off, laid off because the, the budgets are cut. I believe that there is a federal role, uh, but there's still local control that's very important. Uh, 
Uh, and I, I believe, uh, and I've said throughout the primary, I continue to say, that we don't need to get rid of all of No Child Left Behind. We need to change the parts of it uh, that are bad policy, including labeling schools as failing and an overemphasis on standardized tests. But I believe that, the, that there is a federal role in sta saying that states should, in fact, uh, have data that shows how their students are doing. That's a good part of No Child Left Behind. But why do make you, sure for, that for what purpose? For what purpose? To make sure that kids aren't falling through the cracks. To but, make but for what purpose? I mean, you, you yourself have said that you can't depend on that data to determine what teachers ought to be fired first. I'm talking about there's very different data versus standardized test scores. I, I believe in, in assessments and good assessments, and there's assessments that that are actually beneficial uh, to teachers. So those assessments students. would be okay to use when determining which teachers to lay off. Well, I. That I don't know. It would have to be a combination of factors. Uh, but I, I don't see that, that that's a federal issue, is, is saying when teachers can get laid off. That's something no, but that's I'm just, what's the value of that data if, if, if you don't believe that that data can be used for Well, anything. it's to adjust the teaching and the, and the curriculum and, and, and the needs of the school. If, if there's an entire, and we're probably fine here in Oregon, but when you're in Congress, you're making federal policy. And there are some states who might not be keeping track of how their uh, minority populations are doing or how their low-income populations are doing. So I believe that we need that data uh, to be... So the Federal Department of Energy was created when Jimmy Carter was president. It hasn't been that long. Can you point to any benefit that has accrued to the educational system? You said the energy? You said the Federal Department, Department of Energy. Oh. Any benefit that has risked the Department of Energy? Education <laughs> has accrued uh, since the establishment of that federal agency. I mean, there was none prior to Jimmy Carter. So how, how and in what way are we better off, is the educational system in Oregon better off than it was before there was a federal agency? Well, as I said, the, the parts of No Child Left Behind that require keeping track of where student groups are and what they're doing is beneficial. Uh, I don't agree with all of No Child Left Behind. Uh, and and I, I think it's important to have uh, a national focus on education because it's the key to rebuilding our economy. That doesn't take away from local control. It doesn't say you know how teachers have to teach or even what they should be teaching. OK, so now we'll move to energy. There's a lot of data to show that part of the whole green energy initiative is really, doesn't make any sense if you look at the dollars and cents, solar being the best example. I mean, of all people, Bill Gates has made it very clear that he thinks that this country's policy and subsidy of the solar industry makes no sense at all, that under no circumstances will solar ever be able to be so supported by the market, at least not in his lifetime. And yet there's also a lot of data to show that we can responsibly create safe nuclear power. So I'm wondering how the two of you feel about what the, what, what the federal energy policy ought to be and how you would vote to change it if you're a member of Congress. Rob, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, I actually love this issue because I think Oregon could be a leader in this based on the fact that we have terrific in innovation here. We have terrific assets here, such as we, ha we have natural gas, we have water, we have some solar, uh, we have some wind, we have wave capabilities, we have geothermal that's been a part of our state for decades now, especially in, in, in uh, southern Oregon. We just have so many assets uh, that I believe we need to use a more comprehensive approach. We, we have a, a company in Solar World in Hillsboro, a thousand employees, who right now is undergoing some real disputes with China. I understand that. They, they, they claim that China is dumping right now their product into our country and, and jeopardizing them. I will be a champion for the companies that are here, for the companies that have been subsidized. But moving forward, we have to ask ourselves, what is the responsible way to go about making sure that we're energy independent? I'm a supporter, for example, of the pipeline, the Keystone Pipeline. 
Uh, I recognize there are some environmental concerns, but there are always going to be environmental concerns, and that's why we have to act responsibly. But I'd much rather see the pipeline in our country rather than them building some pipeline to Vancouver, B.C. and shipping it off to China for refining, where who knows what they'll do and how, what, what kind of emissions they'll have in that process. I'd rather have, I'd rather have Oregonians and Americans controlling the development of energy sources here in this, in this country and making us not only more energy independent, but also propping up job creation. And it also gives us an opportunity to make, to make America look more attractive for, for development of industries and bring back manufacturing to this country. So there's, there's so many ways that energy can be, can be our future. And we can't pick winners and losers, as they like to say. We can't say, well, this particular energy sector, we like you. You're a friend of the president, so we're going to make sure we prop you up. And others, you're going to have to wait your turn, or you're going to have to pay to play. I think that's wrong. That's called crony capitalism. And it's hurting our country, and it's hurting the confidence we have in our elected officials. We have to give everyone the fair shot at being successful, and frankly, at failing. I absolutely support the renewable energy industry and see Oregon as a place uh, where we can really thrive in those areas. Uh, Solar World, the business in the district Rob was talking about, uh, yes, they have the trade complaint right now, and that's problematic because China's subsidizing the industry over there, and that's hurting our businesses here. But what we need to do is develop all of the uh, uh, sources, like wave energy, which we can be absolutely be a leader on, uh, wind energy, uh, continue fighting for solar energy and making that efficient. But you notice Rob didn't answer the question about nuclear power. I don't support nuclear power until it can be safe. Now look at what happened in Japan. Uh, you may know that uh, I had a hearing scheduled over in Tillamook the day that there was a tsunami warning because of the Japanese earthquake. Uh, I don't see that that is something that we can go move forward on at this point in time. Uh, so uh, I'm not afraid to take a position in that. Rob didn't answer the question. I'll answer it. I support the development of nuclear power in a responsible, safe way. So thanks for the reminder. I forgot to mention it. Do you want to ask about CRC? Yeah, so Rob, what would you say the most pressing transportation need is in your <laughs> CD1? Well, he just tipped me off. Uh, I was going to say it anyway. It's the Columbia River crossing. So it's not, I mean, you must have driven down 99E more times than uh, most people. Absolutely, I have. Having and, been and you've probably driven there. on 217 more times than most people, and 26 more times than most people. So yeah. you, would, you would put the CRC ahead of all three of those corridors? I, I, would put, I would put that corridor from North Portland up into Vancouver as our most pressing transportation need right now as a region. What, why? Well, because that's where most of the traffic takes place, the mo most number of cars, and that's where uh, we absolutely depend on that to be more accessible for commerce. And it's, it's awfully discouraging to learn about organ-based businesses that because of the congestion on I-5, they're having to go to a greater, greater expense and time, and by the way, hurting the environment, by going around I-5, going up to 205 in order to get to Vancouver. So it's a pressing need. It, um, it's, it's also discouraging that it's taken six years and we still don't have a shovel in the ground. 137 million or whatever it is today, I don't, it seems like the figure continues to change based on your reporting as well. And, and I understand fully the, um, the anger of taxpayers when they, they, they believe what they're seeing is a boondoggle in the making, crony capitalism, all this taxpayer dollars being spent and really nothing to show for it. And right now, as I understand it, we're still at the minimum two years away from starting construction. Meanwhile, our economy in, in North Oregon suffers. And I am not going to be a part of a system that rewards crony capitalism. I am going to be vigilant in making sure there's more transparency and accountability in the process. Uh, as a small business owner, that's just the way I'm made. That's my DNA. You know, unlike some people, I've never relied on others to fund me. My business was all self-funded, and so when it comes to spending other people's money, I'm not accustomed to it. So I'm always looking 
at what the bottom line is, what the expenses are, and what the return is. But I, I, I just I appreciate that. I do want to question you on the last part of your answer because your congressional disclosure forms would indicate that you and your wife generate significant income from her property investments. No, it says income, but if you, it doesn't ask for expenses. Okay. And that's why it, it appears as though there's great income. But if it if it the forms would ask for expenses, you'd see a completely different story. So you're not making money from those properties. No. And your your reported income of the last couple of years would not appear to be enough to run uh, two kids in college and a household and a couple of cars. Well, you're not taking into consideration the success we had prior to my run for Congress. Okay. Savings accrued, investments that we make, so that I could do something like this. Okay. Absolutely. Why well, support the CRC? But it's only one of the transportation needs in the district. The other one that comes to mind right away is the Newburgh Dundee bypass. Uh, and that's something that, uh, in fact, to talk about bipartisan, a Republican senator from the district, and I, one of my last things that I did as a state senator was to send a letter with Senator Larry George in support of the Newburgh Dundee bypass uh, transportation grant. Uh, that is a critical need. And yes, I've driven on 217 and 26 many times and, and understand that there are needs there as well. Uh, I'm uh, also concerned about the accountability with the CRC. I believe we need the bridge. We definitely need the jobs. Uh, but people are frustrated because they've seen time go by, uh, the cost projections change, the numbers not line up. Uh, and so right now what I'd like to do is bring together the the Washington and the Oregon Departments of Transportation and say, look, what's keeping you from coming up with a financial plan that really works? Because it's really in their hands now. It's certainly not the only transportation need in the district, though. Uh, so, so Newburgh, Dundee, Bypass, or CRC, which would you, which would you do first? Well, I'd have to. Uh, Newburgh Dundee Bypass, I think, is closer to getting done. So that they're both your, priorities. That would be your first priority. Well, uh, they're both priorities. I'm well, going to pick one of the other. You have to pick one. Why? Because they're, we're, they're, you're in our <laughs> you're in our gym now. These are our rules. Which 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 would you do first? I'd have to look at where they, just how close they are to being ready to go. Uh, it's my understanding the Newburgh Dundee Bypass is much closer to being ready to go. Uh, I. It's an important project, but so is the CRC. Okay. May I add a little bit to my sure. comments on this issue? Um, the other thing that makes the CRC such a complicated issue, as far as, as I see it, is that you're dealing with two states, three or four counties, two mayors at least, counties, uh, excuse me, um, congressional delegations. Uh, it's a complicated issue. Uh, I think it, it requires people, a uh, part of the process, who have the ability to champion for it, be a strong advocate for it, and I'm speaking about I'm speaking about fixing that that, that bridge, and then also moving it forward in a, in a responsible way. Another thing I want to say, I had a conversation with the Washington County Commissioner about transportation because uh, both of us live in Washington County, and this commissioner expressed to me real disappointment in our former congressman who would not work with the county commissioners on deciding where transportation funds should go and ultimately just kind of, you know, deciding by fiat where we're going to spend money. This is why I'm so proud of the fact that we have 21 mayors in the district that have endorsed me and a number of county commissioners who have endorsed me because they recognize I'm going to be a partner. I'm not going to be someone with this, with this congressional cap who says, I know best for District 1, but rather I'm going to go to them and I'm going to say, what are the needs? How can we be helpful on a federal level? Let's make sure that we put a magnifying glass to your needs, and then let's move forward. And I think the sign that I've got such bipartisan support from 21 mayors is a very good sign for our future as a district. Do you want to respond? Absolutely. Uh, that may be easier for Rob to say, but I've actually done that at the state level. Uh, I've worked on a bipartisan fashion, which is why I have support from Democrats and Republicans as well. Uh, Can as you name I was Republicans? Absolutely. Attorney General Dave Frommeyer, former uh, State Representative Lane Shetterly, former State Representative Patty Smith. And and anyone currently serving? Currently serving? Uh, I have In office? District attorneys, yes. Republican district attorneys? Yes. 
Bob Herman, Washington County District Attorney, has endorsed my candidacy. So why do you think 21 mayors, did you say, mm -hmm. in CD1 have endorsed Bob? It's about I don't know. I have mayors supporting me as well. It's about 70% of the total mayors. Mayor Denny Doyle. Uh, I, I don't... I don't know why, because I have a record that uh, can be supported as well. Uh, I think, I perhaps think, they're, they're all Republicans except one, I believe. Columbia County. No, Columbia I have, I have uh, four or five Democrats supporting me and a couple of mayors? independents. Yes. And a couple of independent mayors. But I also think the, uh, the notion that um, she has been bipartisan is just, it's just wrong. She votes 98% of the time with her party, 99% when she had the full majority in the 2009 session. And Ted Ferraioli, the leader of the Republican Party in the Senate, votes 75% of the time with his party. So she's more partisan in her voting than the Republican leader is, by a large margin. So this notion that it's bipartisan is a convenient statement, but if you just look at the record, it's not true. I'd really like to respond to that, <laughs> and I have, and Rob, Rob's heard me say this before. The way that that 98% figure is determined by the Oregonian is that they look at the number of times that I voted with a majority of Democrats during my term in the legislature. So the way the Oregon legislature works, frankly, Congress could use more of this, is that most of what we do is bipartisan or sometimes unanimous. So we did a very thorough analysis of the number of times that I voted with a majority of Republicans. Want to guess what that was? 98%. So it's misleading to say that I vote 98% of the time with the majority of Democrats when I've also voted 98% of the time with the majority of Republicans. And if you look at all the key legislation that I championed, including the Access to Business Capital Act, the Mandate Relief Bill for Schools, the Foreclosure Bill, uh, both the Foreclosure Rescue Scam Bill and, uh, and the Foreclosure Bill from the last session, most of the bills that I've worked on, my pesticide bill, those were bipartisan bills where we had bipartisan sponsorship and bipartisan votes on the floor. Frankly, Congress needs more of that. That's the way the Oregon legislature works. And Rob either doesn't understand that that's the way the Oregon legislature works or he's intentionally misleading people by continuing to use that 98%. Well, the Oregonian did say it was a true figure. And if you look back on her legislative career, I don't think there'd be many times where Republicans would say that she was with them. And I think the true test of bipartisanship is what you do when you're in the majority. And when she was in the majority, there wasn't much effort to bring Republicans into legislation. Only this last session, when the voters demanded bipartisanship by giving us a split house and an almost split Senate, did we have people coming to the table and actually doing things. One of the criticisms that Republicans have leveled against you, uh, Suzanne, is that you are, should you be elected, you, your uh, service would be a continuation of what we've seen since 1998 with David Wu. That your husband worked for David Wu, that you have been a supporter of David Wu, that you've referred to him as a family friend. So can you respond to those? Absolutely. First, first let me say that uh, one thing where I do agree with Rob was when uh, he said the best thing about uh, uh, the resignation of David Wu is that now we don't have to talk about him anymore. So that I agree with. Uh, but uh, I, let me just make perfectly clear. My family's had many friends. Sometimes friends let you down. David Wu let not only uh, my family down, but all the constituents in, in this district. I was planning to run against him when he resigned, uh, and that is clear. My husband didn't work for him. He was his attorney for a period of time. He wasn't an employee, as was suggested right. in some publication. Uh, but moving on, uh, let me just say that I, again, that I agree with Rob, that the best thing about this, his resignation, is we don't have to talk about him anymore. People are tired of talking about David Wu. They don't want to hear about him. And uh, Well, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit about him. I mean, as recently as 2010, you, contrib you personally contributed money to his campaign. This was six years after he essentially admitted to date raping a, a college girlfriend. So I, I, I know you don't want to talk about him anymore, but you have had a close association with him. I don't, I take issue with the fact that it was a close association. I made a donation to him just before the last election because frankly I heard about Rob Cornelis being a Tea Party candidate, uh, being a, a candidate who didn't support a woman's right to make her own health care decisions. And so I made a donation Contributing to a lot of candidates? I do. Indeed. Any Republicans? Not 
that I can think of, no. What about you, Robin? Or some, maybe some nonpartisan candidates, but... Do you contribute not on much? Um, and I, I got to say, um, I think that's a disingenuous statement, just disingenuous statement that you heard I was a Tea Party candidate, and uh, this publication called me a moderate businessman in their endorsement of me last year in the primary. He really doesn't read us. <laughs> <laughs> and you even said in your endorsement of me last spring of 2010 that you favored me over the Tea Party candidate. So it's a convenient label to throw at me now because you know it's divisive. And you've been talking about you're not divisive or offensive. It is divisive to throw labels at people for your own political advantage. Right. So the, you, the, can, can I just clarify? Okay, we're, we're beginning to play ping pong here. Right, but, but you're talking about in a primary. Rob, you yourself said you were the original Tea Party candidate. You spoke at a Tea Party rally. You bragged about going to Tea Party meetings. So you can't now but say... You have the clip. Yeah, which I've seen. So I get to address this? Sure. So her campaign is running a clip. Where she it's says, not, oh, it's not my campaign that's running it. Excuse me, the, the, the DNCC or the DCCC? The DCCC. It's independent expenditure. Right. I can't coordinate. Well, they have a clip of him saying right he was the original. Right. $1.3 million of it, I would add. I uh, I went to a Tea Party event, Suzanne, because they invited me. I'll go anywhere when people would invite me to speak and address, address voters. I'll even go to a Democrat event if they'll invite me. Okay. Second, uh, uh, the other the other uh, accusation you made, I can't remember it now, but, uh, um, oh, about the context of that statement. I was the original Tea Party candidate. Once again, a convenient ploy of the DCCC to extrapolate a statement out of context. The question was simply asked, what's a Tea Party? What's a Tea Party candidate in a forum? And I said... You know, it's hard to define what the Tea Party is, and I'm ne never going to be one to try to do it. And if I try, the Tea Party movement would probably get upset with me because a lot of them don't consider me one, especially their leadership. But I said, if it, back in 2009 when people decided to get off the, off the couch and start paying attention to public policy and public officials, and they just started to get involved uh, and be more engaged in the process, well... That was me. That's what happened to me in the spring of 2009. And that's why in the summer of that year, I decided to run. So in that case, I guess you called me the original Tea Party candidate. Okay, so since we're veering into politics, much. let's stick with this for a minute. I'm, I haven't looked recently, but I'm of the impression, you probably know this as well as these two, that the Democratic, the, the, the Democrats back east have kicked in more money to your campaign than yours. Is that correct? Than the Republicans have for yes. me? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Why, why do you think that's the case? Why do I think the Democrats are spending $1.3 million to right. try to discredit me? And the Republicans are spending a fraction of that to discredit Suzanne. Are they spending a fraction of that? Tell me what, would tell me if the RNCC decides to spend money in my race. They spend no money? <laughs> um, okay, so my question remains. Why, why has the Democratic Party decided that this is a race worth investing in? And in your case, they've decided not to. Because, with all due respect to Suzanne, I don't think they have quite the confidence that she'll be able to win this election without them coming in very heavy. And they've been coming into this race, Mark, since August. Almost daily, and maybe your reporters can attest to this, almost daily the DCCC has, bar has sent a barrage of media right. so, trying to discredit me. So your, your point is they're spending the money because they're worried about They're you. fearful of me. The Republican Party's not worried about Suzanne? I, I can't respond to what the Republican Party has not done or is doing because I don't know. But I, I do know the Democrats are spending money against me. So politically, why are they doing it? Because they know that this district wants a job creator. Because they know we're tired of career politicians. We're tired of more of the same. We're tired of the establishment in Portland, with all due respect, deciding how this district is going to be represented. We tried that for 12 years, and look what we got. We got the worst kind of representation you could ask for. None. What's the... Uh, registration breakdown in your district. I assume this is one area I can get the two of you to agree. <laughs> it's it's about a ten point Democratic edge. And how and then independents are how much? Uh, in the twenty. About the same as Republicans, a little bit below Republicans. So it's thirty twenty twenty. No no no. It's more matter. like more like. Correct me if I'm wrong. 40, 30, 28, 40, 30, right. 30 something, something right. like that. Right. Forty thirty thirty. Yeah, those so, are round figures. So that would suggest that you need to get almost twice as many independents as Suzanne to win this. So what are the people that help you run campaigns? T 
tell you about the independent voter. How are they different than the Democratic voter or the Republican voter in terms of either what interests them, what the demographics? What, what, I mean, what... what, what it, if I may, um, it's just what I said. The voters here, even Democrats, are really concerned about the economy. They're concerned about job growth and stagnation in this state, and not to mention our, our country. They're concerned with overspending that's that's causing people to lose confidence. Suzanne talks about consumer confidence. I'll just talk about voter confidence. Voters don't have confidence in their elected officials. They don't care what party they are. And that's why I've been very clear throughout my campaign, both the primary and the general, when the Republicans have messed up, I've said it. I've stated many times, publicly, privately, in all kinds of interviews, the Republicans have messed up in a handful of areas. And that's because I'm, a, I'm an independent voice, and I'm, I'm not afraid to call it what it is. So who are among the higher-ranking Republicans from outside the state that have come to this state to campaign on your behalf? No one. Same, no one? No one. How about for you? Uh, Nancy Pelosi was here. Uh, Leader Pelosi was here uh, for an event, and Congressman Steny Hoyer is planning to come. So the Pelosi event was kept very much under wraps. Is that correct? Uh, but it was a private event. Yes. It wasn't a public event. Right. It yes. was a private she reception. Made no, she made no, they, they tried to hustle around and out of town. Right? It was a private right. reception. Right. It was a fundraiser as opposed to, right. oh, everybody loves Nancy Pelosi. And correct. You want to have her out at Waterfront Park. Right. Suzanne, I want to ask you. Can I, can I, if it, before sure. that, Nigel, can I just respond to the, there's an allegation about, about first of all, being a career politician. You know, as, as somebody who had a long career in uh, the private sector and the public sector and years of volunteer work and then joined the legislature in 2007, I, I just don't see how that's a career politician. Well, let, me, let me correct what I said then, because I, I appreciate that, Suzanne. A career insider. People are tired of insiders determining the direction of this state and the direction of this country. Do you want to respond to his claim that the reason why the, the DCC is the DCCC is pouring money is because they're worried? But they, first of all, they didn't spend the money. They did a reserve. Uh, because, money. because we are expecting, as you'll see starting today, a tax on me. Uh, we need to be able to respond. But they just started they, today? Uh, Rob's campaign just put new attack ads up against me today. What, what do they say? Uh, you should ask Rob. <laughs> I wouldn't call them attack I ads. I well, quoted the Willamette Week. I quoted the Oregonian. Okay. They're, they're uh, sort of d typical what a what a Democrat would expect from a partisan Republican attack, to, uh, you know, about taxes. Okay. But but I want to say. But meanwhile, that meanwhile, I have to wait for. I've had five months of attacks from the party that she represents, and we now put out a contrast ad which quotes local publications, and she's calling it an attack. This is hardly a fair fight. <laughs> Why do you think that the Triple C is spending all this money? Because they care about the race and they care about the district, and I believe they have significant confidence in me. Okay. Um, Suzanne, can you tell me something at which you have failed or which you have looked back upon and said, I, I did that incorrectly or I wish I'd done it differently? As a legislator or can you as pick a. Pick something in your as life. A mother? <laughs> pick some, I, want, I want to know something that you, that you failed at or screwed up and what, and what you learned from. Well, I, I have overcome several challenges working my way through college. I, I don't think I failed at that. Um, Have you ever introduced a bill you wish you hadn't introduced? Did you ever vote the wrong way on a bill? Did you ever? Well, say I'm something? confident with my voting record. Well, I, I guess I'll say that there was a bill that I introduced that uh, uh, I, I should, probably could have explained a little better and didn't pass. And I'm being accused of uh, wrongfully accused of increasing the cost of marriage licenses. And it was a bill that a constituent asked me to put in. It wasn't a fee. It was a cap on what an officiant can charge. And all of a sudden, people thought it was increasing the cost of a marriage license. And so it didn't pass. We were going to bring it up again, but decided not to. So what did you, so learn? Just, what, what did you learn from that? I probably could have spent a little bit more time explaining it. Uh, but it, it wasn't you know, it was critical of something a constituent had asked me to do. And, uh, and, and I could have spent more time, perhaps, explaining it to my colleagues to say, 
you know, it's, it's, this isn't a fee. It's not increasing a fee. It's a cap, but it's certainly. So, so you've never really made any significant mistakes. Uh, well, at this point, I can't think of significant mistakes. No, I'm happy with. Rob, Rob, you made a significant mistake. Um, I would say not a significant mistake, but one thing that I think I don't do well, a good enough job at, is staying in touch with people that have meant something to me in my life, professionally especially. You know, I've had a lot of employees over the years, and, um, you know, I'd like to be able to say I know where all, all of those 60 employees are today, former employees. Uh, but I don't. And I think it's because I'm pretty focused on the here and now. Um, and sometimes I need to stop and reflect a little bit and, uh, and kind of take stock or inventory of those relationships. Um, this may seem like an insignificant question. If so, so be it, I guess. Um, Peter DeFazio has been trying for several years to pass a law that would create almost the equivalent of a real estate transfer tax on stock transactions over a certain amount. Either of you have a position on that? I don't know enough about his proposal, but one thing that's that's come in, in the news recently is uh, the Stock Act, which basically would disallow insider trading ha happening within Congress. Okay, that's not this bill. Okay. I didn't think it was that bill, but right. uh, that's, so, a, that's something I would support, by the way. That type of legislation. So if you have a position, I mean, it's pretty much as I described it. It would place a fee on transactions over, I think, $200,000 a year um, that would actually end up raising several billion dollars to reduce the deficit. It's a tax. Yeah, I, generally speaking, um, I don't believe we're under tax right now. Okay. So I can't see myself, based on that explanation, supporting that. Okay. You familiar with it? Yes, I, I am familiar with it. Uh, I don't know the current uh, version of the bill or what the details are, uh, but I, I would support a financial transactions task, a ta uh, tax or fee if it was structured uh, to be fair. Okay. Uh, and that's the way I look at any tax measure. What, what, by fair, what do you mean? That it, that it made sure that it, that it was uh, responsible for people who could afford it and not impact low income or struggling middle class families. So fair, you don't mean equitable, you mean fair, you mean progressive. Progressive, correct. Progressive as in progressive versus regressive, not progressive can, as in equitable. Can both of you weigh in on the, the efforts by Congress to extend the payroll tax waiver, which they ended up doing, what, for three months? Two months, right. Two months, how you would have voted, what you, you know, I, I guess actually if one of you is elected, you will have a chance to vote on the extension, which I assume will come up in one form or another. Well, I, I certainly would have supported it, and I think it's important to not raise taxes on low-income uh, and struggling families, middle-class families, people trying to get back to work right now. Again, it's one of those examples of uh, Congress not doing their job. There are too many people now who need jobs. Congress needs to do its job. I was disappointed that it was only for two months uh, and that there were a lot of things added to it. Uh, this is uh, something that's going to help families, uh, and, and by not extending it, it would have uh, increased the burden on our families who are trying to get back to work. So, uh, again, this is another reason why uh, people are frustrated with Congress and why they need someone with a record of getting things done, uh, someone with the right priorities. Uh, I support ending and talking about the need for, for revenue, and we absolutely have to attack the, uh, you know, tackle the, the debt and the deficit, but we need to do it with the right priorities. I support ending the Bush tax cuts on millionaires. Uh, and my opponent has said he does not support ending that tax cut. I support ending tax breaks and subsidies for big oil companies making record profits. Uh, we ought to be investing in you know, education and job training uh, rather than giving away uh, tax dollars to companies that are making profits. So the way I analyze uh, tax issues is to look at whether they're progressive, not regressive. Uh, and I saw that the, uh, the payroll tax extension was part of that. We need somebody with the right priorities. I have those priorities. Can, can I ask you each to pick three words that you would use to describe yourself? They're probably going to be adjectives. Can I respond to the last question as well? Yes. I'm sorry. 
yeah, to interrupt your train of thought, but I just like to first of all on the payroll tax, uh, first of all, because I agree with you on the payroll tax, it should have been extended. Uh, the fact that it's in 60 days is ridiculous. Nobody plans 60 days. No business owner plans for 60 days out. And consumers or voters need the certainty as well. Uh, it's just a sign, again, of partisanship and gridlock in Washington adversely affecting all of us back home. Um, she is right. I do not support uh, the elimination of what she calls the Bush tax cuts because, to me, that's just raising taxes in a broken system. The system's broken. If we do that, it's, per, it's projected that'll be $100 billion in revenue. Fantastic. Now we still have a $1.2 trillion deficit just last year. Now what are we going to do? So it's, it's, to me, it's not serious legislation or it's not serious leadership to say, let's eliminate the Bush tax cuts. I mean, even if we tax the richest people in the world, in the, excuse me, in the country, and, and they can take care of themselves. But let's just say we tax them at 100%. I hear it's a $1.5 trillion in revenue that would bring in. Fantastic. That eliminates one year of deficit spending that we're currently undergoing. Now what are we going to do in year two when there are no more people who have any wealth in this country? It's just, it's, it's populism that's not moving any conversation forward. I'm about finding a whole overhaul of the tax system like President Clinton did with the Republican Congress in the late 90s, like Tip O'Neill did with President Reagan in the 80s, it can be bipartisan. And, and to p continue to play um, politics with people's income is not helpful. We're not making any progress. And I would add, I don't know how Suzanne would accomplish that when she'd be the minority in a Republican-controlled house. It's just a campaign promise. It's never going to be fulfilled. Let's talk about fixing it. That means we eliminate corporate loopholes where companies like GE and Verizon and, and Pepco are making billions of dollars off the tax code. That's unfair. And individuals as well are doing that. Let's stop corporate welfare to the rich people. We'd save a lot of money that way. And let's also lower rates so that middle class Americans get more cash in their pocket to put back into the economy, to pay for their mortgage, to pay for their kids' education, etc. I'm talking about serious reform, not these band-aid approaches, which people continue to propose month after month, year after year. It's not getting us anywhere. Thank you. Now, three words. I'm sorry. Yes, so I think the fairest way to do this is you'll have to alternate. So, Suzanne, we'll start with you. One word. You can use to describe yourself, and then a word, and then we'll go back. Just humor us here for a second. Can we use a uh, hyphenated? No. <laughs> Okay, diligent. Okay. Rob? Visionary. Suzanne? Intelligent. Rob? Compassionate. Suzanne? Caring. Measured. On to the, to the last question sure. before that, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I just think it's interesting that Rob is complaining about tax breaks when he was part of this proposal to do the change of the Coliseum that relied on a whole series of tax breaks. And I guess he doesn't like tax breaks unless they're for his own project. So I was, just wanted to point that out. Wow. Well, could you respond to that, Rob? Sure. Yeah. What we were talking about is a concept of great jobs in Oregon. And there's a big difference between providing a federal tax credit, which would have been at the most $16 million, versus billions of dollars of profits largely made overseas by mega corporations in this country and hedge fund managers, and they pay zero federal income tax. There's a big difference. I, I took a bipartisan approach in this city to try to create jobs using our existing assets. I went to the mayor's office, I went to the city councilor's office. I went to the county commissioner's offices, including the chair. I went to even representatives of the, of the governor's office. I went to our state treasurer. I went to business leaders, community leaders, regardless of party affiliation. As a private citizen, because I didn't think our elected officials are doing enough to create jobs creatively in this market, and I said, 
let's put some ideas on the table. Let's, let's brainstorm. And one of the ideas was, a, was becoming a qualifier of a federal tax credit. Along with, I would add, a lot of private, most of it, vast majority of it, would be private investment dollars brought into our state from people who want to invest in Oregon. I think that shows visionary leadership. Um, on a side note, did you either formally or informally apply for a job with the Blazers? I was considered for a job with the Blazers several years ago. Which would what job? I'd rather not say. By several years ago, is that more than two years ago? Yes. Um, you're both spending a lot of your time on the phone raising money. All of that may be coming to an end. And one of you will win, most likely, and it'll start up again for whichever, whomever is elected and maybe for the other futures, both for the primary and for November. Um, there's almost nobody who thinks about this who doesn't think that the chase for money is at the heart of what's wrong with Congress and corrupts everybody associated with it. Everybody. So one of you is going to get elected and become corrupt. How do you feel about that? I disagree. Uh, you disagree with I, I, everything that no, has been written about this subject. No, I don't disagree with everything. Fire. I disagree that that when I'm elected, I'll become corrupt. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Because I have, for the last, the three sessions that I served in the legislature, also had to raise money. And when I make a decision How about. How much money did you raise when you ran per cycle? How much money? A couple hundred thousand dollars. How much money are you raising? A lot more than that, whatever. So, in, in terms of scale, it's, it's, it's almost not even. Right. I, I understand, Mark, but I made a commitment to myself in the very first time that I ran for office that the decisions that I make about a piece of legislation will be based on whether that's good policy for the district, for the constituents, and for the district I represent. Not you don't think when you get to DC that Nancy Pelosi is going to come to you and say, I don't give a shit about your district, you're voting the way I see well, she might do that, but I'm going to say I'm voting for my district. And, and I have to tell you that, that the, the, that's the way I acted in the Oregon legislature. I never had leaders telling me who to vote for. I heard Rob say at the McMinnville so chamber that he's already corner, talked to. Are, are you a better, more honorable, and have more spine individual than the 434 other members of Congress? Well, I personally don't know all of them, well, <laughs> but I'm, I'm making a commitment that, just as I did when I ran for the legislature, that I will not be corrupted by campaign donations. I've already heard Rob say in McMinnville to the chamber that he's already talked to the Republican leadership and they're going to let him vote a certain way. I'm not going to my party leadership to ask them how I should vote. So l let me ask you this. I mean, I can't imagine that you haven't thought about this. You're, you're someone who... cares about integrity and party and special interests in Washington, D.C. I mean, find find a contribution, an independent expenditure just to start with that's coming to help me. So, I mean, I think... You, you must have thought Absolutely. about Absolutely. I care about it You must have read the same much. books that we've all read. I care about it very much. So does it worry well, you? Well, that's why I support campaign finance reform. And at the independent party, uh, in fact, I've been endorsed by the independent party of Oregon in in large part because I have that position, that I believe we ought to get work on getting more money out of politics. Uh, I don't know if you can feel the irony in all of this. This is, this is being said by the same person who has...